Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be doing chapters 84 to 86. I hope that you enjoy. There is no epic lucha, only puns, chapter 84, for whom the dungeon trolls. The chewing of bones was a little disturbing as Dalta watched the monster known as the troll reach through the hole and an English accented bear trying to find some delicious honey. In this case, the honey being more of the screeching bear skeletons and minders undead variety that would try to pierce through the skin of the brittle weapons that did little to deter the determined troll. Pale, yellow eyes squinted as the troll pulled out something and it came back with what looked like a green slime, but in a clear, dripping liquid. That's flipping ectoplasm. Those spooky birds and the ghosts, then they're swarming us about now, Jack said in surprise before he turned his gaze to the troll. Hero, I am in awe of the size of this lad. He looks like he eats brick crap houses for a starter meal. I could have used him back in the day. Jack said as he scampered up the troll's back to stand on one of his shoulders. How goes the number crunching? Crunching being a bit more literal than these spooks are used to. Jack added, and the troll blinked at him, and Delta moved closer as well. The large creature smiled a stupid grin of pleasure at her. Ma, look, I got a soft crunch. I can smear it on the bones for sauce. He showed off a large yellow teeth that were crushed diamonds. Delta smiled weakly, but often Maestro, Bob, and even a few others. The troll was manageable. Delta put a reminder on her internal diary to cry about her desensitization to monsters and their appearance. Good. Glad you're enjoying your life already. You're a good troll. Delta said after a beat, Davina came up and the troll blinked before he shyly turned his gaze back to the flailing skeleton that he had just grabbed and was stuffing into his mouth to pretend that he was busy. Was his grey skin turning black with blush? You are quite strong, Sir Troll, Davina praised as the flush travelled all over the troll's body. Inchi eyed him. What? You don't get a bone to pick with Dev and Inchi? The bird sang. Rail appeared next to them, and his shoulders was numb and Billy. Numb, looking pleased by the ride, Billy less so. But the idea of the sniper spot was keeping him still. Home monsters were a goddamn fusing now. Rail being a walking fortress of muscle as Billy fired arrows from above. Numb would just rain down fists. Actually, it's not a bad idea. Delta shook her head and the troll's eyes lit up with joy. Gobbos! Trolls and gobbos go together like meat and bone, like caves and bats, like, like, troll and gobbos. The creature said finally, ignoring the hide filled with leering skulls and ghostly hatred. Goblins, trolls, spooky underground ruin filled with dead things. Delta felt that she had a teetering dangerously close to being sued. If a fire demon turned up, then she was going to have to run for the hills and hope no one served her for a court day. Great, we needed a walking mass of destruction that eats everything in its path. After all, we left bacon upstairs, Swark cackled, his staff giving off a few sparks of fire and the troll paled at the sight of something horrible. Fire is bad. Gobbo, no, not like fire. The troll accused, Divina, without looking, kicked Swa hard enough to send him rolling into Delta's core with a thunk. Watch out for mother. Divina huffed. This was enough to make the troll beam again. Pretty Divina. Blah best gobbo, not gobbo, said the pleased looking troll. Delta was just watched this unfold, watching how this new piece of her family started into the dynamics. Divina, the witch doctor corrected, Defi. Da vi na she repeated, her face growing pained. Da vin ha he confusedly responded. Dev and Inchi. Inchi supplied, and the troll tried to pet the bird and nearly pressed Davina's head into her torso. Devi and Inchi, he said proudly. The witch doctor frog threw her hands up in disgust. Fine, Dev, what's your name? she asked with a snap. Rail opened his mouth, but Davina turned her glowing eyes at him. You utter one name, and I'll ram that trident up your nose. She warned, Rail froze, and then wisely shut his mouth. Meat tank, 
Jack said quickly. Swar, rubbing his chin, looked like he was going to vote for that name. Dalza turned to see the hole in the door, and both repairing itself and being opened with weapons. The ghosts brushing against her room, and Dalza's manner repelled their forms easy enough. But it was more effort than Dalza wanted to spend on every second of her time here. We are not naming him that, she said, and all the eyes stood to her. In fairness, one does not simply name a sentient being. One merely suggests and sees what sticks. I suggest that we try some names when we're secure and have a lovely vote where we duel each other and I blow you all up with the prepared traps and win. Jack said sagely from the top of the troll. Jack? Dalta said calmly. The cobalt tilted his head. Hero of lovely lady of the dungeon, came the response. You are banned from naming anything. Short of a complete disaster and a lack of structured command, where me and you are both offline and every monster that came before you is mute, dead or missing. Dalta said pleasantly as she rolled her neck. But what about my pet bombs? They are so fleeting, he grasped, and the troll calmly plucked him from his shoulder and held the cobalt up to his eyes to examine the scaled creature. You can name them as you start throwing them through that hole. I'm losing mana from fending these buggers off. Divina, more spirit Swa, and Billy, I'll try to make some ports for the both of you to fire from. These two doors are the only thing keeping us safe, and everyone, save Jack and the troll, is not at full power. I want to secure the command post to mine gas from and build more pylons. She ordered, trying to use new as an inspiration to rope the chaos back on track. The troll focused and there was a horrid noise that made Delta's pose break and Davina gag and Inchi fall down like a dead canary bird in a mine shaft as she fled. Jack looked like he was waving an empty flask around to bottle the stench, and the goblins hooted madly with laughter as they tried to take positions to wage war. Found gas, the troll offered. Dalta swallowed back her first words and then forced a smile. Thank you, I'm going to call you Jebediah. It fits more than I'd like to admit, Dalta said. The troll frowned hard. jeb He tried, Jeb, just go with Jeb. Delta said quickly, and the troll looked pleased as punch. Jeb, Jeb the trolley, at my service. The troll roared in approval and saluted, sending Jack, who had been still holding, flying through the air. The attack on the door paused for a second, and he stood there, and Delta finally got a proper look at the troll. Most of his skin was soft on the inside of his arms and legs, but his joints, fingers, and most of his shoulders looked to be carved in a grey, crusty rock-like shell that acted like a natural armor. His head and body had little to no neck between them, which likely gave him a heck of an ability to use his thick skull as a battering ram if he could pick up enough speed. Delta turned to the menu and showing the info of Jebediah. Quote, Troll Jebediah Trolls are nature's answer to the question of what would happen if a rock decided to grow legs and devour villagers. They boast incredible defenses and strength befitting their size, as well as a moderate regenerative factor. Their blood is highly sought after for potions that involve great healing. Their skin, once treated, can be used as armor, and their stomach acid is potent. They have a fear of fire, as they are somewhat flammable. No evolutions unlocked yet. Dalta had a giant beat stick, and she didn't even have to tribute any of the monsters to bring it out. Life was good, but it would be better if the undead army could stop knocking on the door for a second. Jebediah was uh, currently picking a giant potato of a nose with a finger, as they seemed to be deep in thought. Jack picked himself up, looking rather cheerful for being tossed like an excited troll, and waltzed over. Listen, you mad Jack here. He began and Delta snorted. Why would anyone not listen to you when you begin a line like that? He said dryly. The Kambold grinned and pointed to the two large doors. I don't know what you can do about the dungeon core powers, but you said something about blowholes, right? He asked, expression a little more serious. I did mention portholes for the goblin to fire from, yes. She stated. Jack waved it off as unimportant. All holes are blowholes if you fill them with bombs. Just trust me on that, he said with an almost scarily pleased expression. He pointed at the door. Can you fix her up? 
and give us some windows way up, with a ladder and a platform. If we can clean the mess of bony pricks down than a small crowd, we can send Jeb a boy here to do some skull cracking, and I can start laying traps and slow the next wave. Not sure how much time it'll take you to fill up the place with your magic dust and make it all weird, but we'll buy you time. Jack explained, his claws tightly marking his plan on the stone floor. Dalton nodded after a moment, trying not to let Jack's sudden logic scare her. No worries, just need to push them back long enough for me to beef up the door. Even if these guys were human once, Sis doesn't consider them to be so anymore, and that means upgrading whenever and whatever I want. Dalton snapped her hands together with a smile. At a girl! I'll go move Jeb so Dev can do her magic show. He announced, Jeb, come see what Devi do magic. Come see the foggy make your happy light, Jack crooned. Jeb looked like his day had just been made and Divina looked like Jack had just called her an, an obese sow. For foggy, the woman said, such an offended tone that even Dalt winced. Foggy, Devi, gonna show Ma and me some foggy magic. Jeb demanded, his feet stomping away from the door to give Davina a clear shot at the growing hole. Billy slid up next to her and took aim with the more dangerous arrows. Gobbos and foggies, aren't we terrifying, Billy snorted. This floor has been nothing but a smear on my pride and patience. Davina huffed, unable to glare too hard at the excited troll's face. Delta hid a smile while the woman began to exaggerate her arm movements as she began to call on more spirits. Hear my call, O oh spirits of the green and life. Help me, return to the poor fools back to the embrace. She called and Delta shook her head, even more amused. Davina was supposed to be her level-headed monster, and yet she couldn't resist showing off to Jeb. The balls of nature gathered around her finger, drawn from the lush powers of the second floor. Even weakened, Davina had a whole jungle to draw on her source of power. It wasn't like Damagost or Wyam, not a druidic in nature. Delta paused and then smiled at her own little joke for a moment before she watched Davina's spirits draw more power than before. Davina was a witch doctor and drew upon the souls of the spiritual world rather than the physical life and growth of the material world. Her spirits were those of growth and green. Their power could help ground to become fertile and bright a land. They whispered secrets of potions to her, the art of herbs and medicinal brews, and they even seemed to guide her at times. Delta didn't know what they were exactly. They didn't register as monsters or guests. They came off as an extension of Divina's aura, a part of hidden up from Delta's sight, some secret piece of Divina held close to her heart. Delta respected that and didn't fret too much. If Davina needed help or had issues with that part of her existence, then Dalta would help. No doubt, if she was to create some priest or such, their connection with any deity would be personal and hidden to Dalta. The five buzzing nature orbs suddenly screeched forward and bowled through the bony hands. The ghosts got it worse as their forms literally burst apart in slimy explosions of ectoplasm. The odd energy keeping their souls and skeletons' minds anchored to this plane lashed out and yanked the black souls deeper into the fortress as Davina guided the orbs in a dance of death and life. The light coming from the hole in the door erupted and the orbs exploded. The sounds of bones raining down and stone on the floor soon followed. Devi crunched bones without touching them. Devi, much better troll than me. Jeb whispered as softly as a runaway lawnmower to Jack. Nonsense, you simply have talents better suited for a uh, more manual labor, my good lad. Jack promised. Billy narrowed his eyes as he loaded a new type of arrow. It looked rather similar to the blood mushroom of the second floor. He fired at the arrow and slid it off the metal fingernail that Billy had clipped onto his real nail. The arrow was slightly snicked and it began to bulge as it soared through the hole in perfect accuracy. Delta got as close as she could and saw the arrow violently explode, spraying black liquid over the gathering bone soldiers. The bones began to hiss, and a few of them fell apart as the joints were sprayed. Still got some kinks to work out before Mum will let me use that one on people. He said annoyed, as if Delta's aversion to melting people was ruining his fun. Delta disagreed, but she hadn't had the time to lecture Billy about morals 
again. She focused on the twin doors. The lack of foes touching them made it much easier as she pulled the menu options. Quote, Twin doors at the entrance hall. You may enter any time if you like, but you can never leave. Improve the wood to be more durable, 10 DP. Create twin port windows near the top to rain down hell on foes, 15 DP. Install climbable ladder on the wood to lead up to the windows. Add a platform to stand on, 5 DP. Install slivers of iron into the wood to cause damage to ghosts, 15 DP. Close the doors after a certain time, 5 DP. Have the doors open automatically when allies approach from the outside. Can be overridden by the core, 10 DP. It was all pretty good and basic things. The iron chips and the wood especially sounded great right about now. They were all cheap so she purchased a lot. The only thing standing between her core, her monsters, and the army of living dead was those damn doors. If Dancer saw something stronger than bones and slime come her way, she might, for the first time, build traps. The idea was so alien that she had actually forgotten where the option was for her menu. Jack was right, until she could claim the space, it might be worth filling the halls with so many traps that it would be an issue in itself to invade Delta. How did it work out that she needed traps to keep things in, not out? Delta guessed that that was just how she rolled now. The twin doors glowed with orange hues as the dark wood became glossy and lines of metallic iron streaked along the massive panels. A line in both the doors sunk in and left behind a simplistic ladder rungs that each spreading to a semicircle platform. Delta flew up to each platform that had a large hole cut out of it, and the only way to close the holes were to put down comically large corks. Dalton stared, but there was indeed a giant version of corks from Freya's new wine bottles. Sis was getting creative. Buddy and Swa raced up to the top, Buddy winning due to simply spending more time climbing and the fact that Swa had a hefty staff and mask up the ladders. Take those suckers down, Delta yelled, and the goblins didn't even need that much encouragement before explosive arrows and fireballs were being hurled with glee. Cute little balls of destruction, her goblins were. The hole in the door was fully repaired, and a few battled axes had got through to attack suddenly found the rotting twin doors to have gained a mighty impromptu paint job. The ghosts literally smoking and hissing as they tried to pass through to devour her manor, her especially nice to see. The most annoying part of it all was that even the bones and ghosts bits had landed in her room through the windows. She couldn't absorb them. The essence of the parts that mattered were being called back to the damn annoying power. No, she called out, and she just noticed the box hadn't been present since she came down here. Odd, it wasn't like new to miss out a chance for potential dungeon superiority matches, and a chance of bloodshed. Quote, I'm here, but sis and I have been busy. News box was shimmering into sight, and Delta stared as somehow the blue box looked static and grey in places as if chunks had been bitten out of him and downright ripped off. Quote, Tis but a flesh wound. The force behind these damn things has been trying to slyly infiltrate the system to get you, but Sis is pissed. She's beginning to be full on war with this little snug. This was so alarming that Delta turned to glare at New. Why didn't you tell me? I could be helping. She demanded, upset to see her menu, her friend so damaged. What state was Sis in? Quote, you have been helping. Claiming this room and blowing his pets up has been wonderfully distracting. News utter calmness was getting to Delta, and she shook her head. I can do more, she protested. Quote, no, not now. We are your menu. We are the system that exists to support you. What good are we if we let bugs crash the system? Hmm? Your battle is here. Trust us to deal with what we do best. This complicated behind-the-scenes stuff. You turned to look at the fortified door. Quote, Besides, you have your hands full. He was about to praise Delta. She could feel it. But Jeb peered down and tried to smash New's little box like a fly. Globe gone. He smiled proudly. New flicked above the hand. Quote, Core, almighty, system support me. You summoned the troll and it's already wonky. Why is it? Where is it? The gruff killing machine. 
Delta shrugged. In there somewhere. The killing we got, but can you kill that which is already dead and keeps coming back? Or do you just sort of inconvenience it? She mused. She got New's attention with a snap of her fingers. How is this? She reminded him of the question, opening her menu to see what options she had available to beef up a current call room. Mortal tasking soothed her for some reason. Before New could answer, the answer itself became clear as Delta's menu sparkled and flickered so badly that she couldn't see any other options. She stared at it for all three seconds before she snapped her gaze to New. Got to her and make sure that she's alright. She commanded him. New was gone in a second. Bye bye, Glowbug, Jeb said sadly. Delta could fret, Delta could panic. Hell, she could even pace and worry, but she wasn't going to do any of those things. New's words and Sis's issues made her know exactly what to do. Sure, she couldn't box zap the teleport like New into hidden depths of her own dungeon system, but she knew how to help. It was something that she was very good at. Zwa, Billy, hurry it up. I want those doors ready to open. She ordered, and her voice was so sharp that her goblins nodded without any hint of joy or backtalk. Got it, Mum. Give me a minute to focus. She turned to Rail and Davina, but they met her gaze with understanding. Rail's muscles bulged as he actively frowned. Davina looked more mystical as she gathered power. Jack rubbed his chin. I like the sight of you, hero. Jack's at your command. Lead him well. The cabalt grinned. Delta just nodded as she eyed the most important part of this plan. Jeb, I need you to listen closely to your ma, okay? She called softly. The troll nodded instantly. When that door opens, I need you to make all the bones and slime spilled people go away. Can you do that? She asked with a warm smile as if she wasn't about to let loose a troll into the hallway to rampage. No one messes with sis. That girl did nothing but her best and something had the goal to bite new and to tear him up to attack sis. Heck the frick no. Clear came the response. Go, 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 Swa screamed. Delta swiped one hand at the door, swung open. The sniper nest above, now having no means to escape unless her goblins jumped. Jeb roared, and the room shook as he eyed the approaching skeletons. You won't touch my ma! He shouted as he took off, lumbering like a force of nature. Charge! Delta yelled. Her frogs weaved into battle, Jack lobbing bombs that exploded with the thunder and laughter and troll gas. Num took up the tail end and his fists cracked and left overs with ease. Look at me, you creepy son of a birch, Delta whispered, hands clenched tight. I'm right here and I'm coming for you, she said, her core blazing behind her. Sis gasped as the tendril of, well, nothing lashed at her. Her chair had been overturned and her white dress was torn along the sleeve and her bare feet were covered in scratches. She shielded herself and dozens of box and slots covered her like armor. She repelled the touch of nothing. It devoured some boxes, ruined others, nothing Sis couldn't fix given time. She reached out and the sword of blazing gold appeared in her grasp. Thank you, Yarl. Now go before it finds you. She yelled to the golden box that tapped appeared. She swung, and the space of the system erupted with a golden fire, pushing the invaders back. It wasn't enough. Yol's sword was good, but it had been quickly made a weapon, not its usual grand style. The green box appeared in a shield of a shining emerald appear on her arm. The other side was a sapphire and glimmering, twin-sided shield. You two go so well, sis cut the communications. Sis watched as the gold fire and the box were drained, turning to dust and endless silence. You are such a pain. Always have been, you dirty cheater. She growled, and the comment almost sent nothing into a fit of rage. Sis winced as she felt the attack coming up. Silence had done nothing but make the invader's mood worse. She was about to hope the twin shield would hold when a comet of blue smashed into the being and new form reappeared. Without a word, they began to make the thing chase them both. This enraged him further. Just like old times, Sis mused. It all came to a stop when the nothingness and silence was broken by something in the distance. A single mushroom poked its head out of the bleak endless nothing. It blazed orange 
and a second appeared. Then it stopped. Bliss blinked and the attacks ended. You laughed with delight. Yes, it's so much better watching her mess up other people's grand plans. He laughed like a madman and Sis couldn't blame him. She wanted to laugh as well. The single glowing mushroom had pushed back the nothing and that was the last thing Sis saw before she resecured the hole and patched a crack in the system. Her smile slipped once she noticed how many things that she had to be fixed. Delta's orange manner had slipped into more parts of her system. Not good, but also kind of good. Room configuration was kind of important, but it was only Delta and that point had been weird, not broken. What else could the system ask for? Ruli wanted the contract to sob to Delta just so she could kiss the damn girl. Delta had a bar, a real bar with seats and drinks, and a grumpy barmaid. But the best part was that no one could steal Rudy's favorite seat. Yes, she had already chosen the best seat in the house, a large stool in the corner where no one was not too close to or not too far from the musical mushrooms, which were playing some oddly energetic music that Rudy could see herself rushing into battle to. Close enough to order a drink, but not too pushed by the others ordering drinks. Good view of the room, enough space behind her to feel safe, but not paranoid. The only downside was that this place was missing the three stooges. Vera, Rudy had to pry the name out of her own tip, told her that they were in a mission to clean Delta's basement. One, Delta having a basement was odd for a dungeon, and two, she couldn't see that an Jerk swore doing anything without a good reason and tons of bribery. Must be some near disaster on the third floor. Maybe Delta made a casino or befriended some hydra worm. Delta had good with people like that. She sighed as she sipped her mushroom brew. It had a mix of special stuff of durance in it, but Farrah had put her own spin on it all the while, so that it was spicy and a little tongue-numbing. Rudy didn't like it at first, but then she did and she drank it again, and then she felt conflicted. The drink was, quite oddly, disgustingly tasty. Ruli sipped it with a grimace and then sighed in contentment. She could see why the slip of a girl got wasted. This place was just the best. It helped that Freya had no proper concept of prices for the outside, so everything was dirt cheap. Something Rudy would fix when she was, uh, leaving. Just being a good guest... What's a girl got left to enjoy? Fishing beer, no kuss or mum. This is a good life. Rudy downed her drink with a gag before burping in pleasure. So where's Delta at? Rudy asked politely. Vera gave her a long look. Fighting some silence broke on the third floor. Waging war on some dead army and I can't do nothing cause I gotta keep an eye out for guests. Right? Vera complained. She blinked as the mug rattled on the bar. The woman gone faster than Ferrer could detect. She heard Fran's door being kicked open and nothing else. She eyed the copper coins and shrugged. At least she paid her tab. Ferrer smirked as she poured herself a glass of Lord Mushy's wine. Shame if Mama suddenly got some help in the form of a powerful woman. Be a real shame. Delta watched through Davina's eyes as Jeb turned after finally putting down the remains of the large iron skeleton and nearly choked in dismay as Jeb lumbered back with one of his arms having been torn off. He looked in a little pain and a little confused, but he beamed as Davina tried to fuss over him. No worries, Debbie. Pain is already gone, see? He boasted and Delta couldn't look. Jeb went on as Rayo swished his trident and beheaded some ghosts. His trident clearly a bit more than just for show that Delta had assumed. She had never seen a ghost be beheaded, vanished and then reappear whole only to get blasted by Divina. I'm gonna be back in a day. What's a few hours? Jeb shrugged. Delta blinked and sure enough, the little nub of bone was already growing out of the stump. Gross, but also kinda cool. She hadn't forgotten Jeb could regenerate, but she didn't think that it would work on the entire limbs. The hallways were being cleared up by the time they pushed on. Then the damn army would just be back again. Where this damn summoner or a creepy renic keeping them here? Delta also didn't want Jeb to fight that thing again. Jeb didn't have a spawn room. We have to send Jeb back if we can't make any progress. Without a spawn room he won't come back. 
Delta said, her voice actually coming out of Davina's body like an echo. Everyone blinked, but Jack sounded the word room over and over. Well, some rooms ahead. Got one with a few books, got one with a statue, got one with a forged demon's workroom. But I was emptied, and I think I moved on. Jack rumbled, but Delta now knew what to expect at least. Worst room becomes the troll space. We can set up more choke points from there, she ordered. Her friends and monsters nodded grimly, pushing onwards to the next room. Jack placed an odd thin traps along the way that would detonate if triggered. Delta was going to make sure that he was the first one to walk back. Delta focused and fretted on the next room's door that loomed ahead. She had an odd feeling that she wasn't going to like what she was going to find in there. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 85. Silent Night. The statue room served as what could only be the cult of the silence's vision of the life on the world. The glass statue filled with an odd swirling mists in the shape of a giant round mouth full of tentacles and fangs that buried deep into the world. There was just something a little off about the statue. Well, two things, besides the evil jellyfish trying to snack on it. Oh dear, they think the world is flat. Dalton mumbled as the moor howled the land like a table on a stand. The land was coloured and made of various materials. Someone had gone to great lengths to implant gems of different colours into the various places. Dalton could see a golden amber crystal glowing inside the tiny model of a city. A sapphire and emerald had been squished together in a city that looked like bisected. The deep red one looked to be somewhere in the desert and Dalton snorted. Red in the desert, cliché much? She said when Davina cleared her throat, sounding like she was trying to say something and she was still a little awkward to admit. Delta paused, but the room was oddly empty of foes for the moment. Delta, the world is flat. New blinked into the view of the next to her, looking much better than before. New, right? Let me share the science of my world, Delta said with a finger wag. Sis... Delta crooked her head, and suddenly she felt like she was being ping-ponged across the game board of Pinball Machine. Sis let her flow between herself and others. The connection, the path was so rocky and confusing that Delta wanted a hole, pinged of a wall of gold. Oh, hello. Did Sis get the core con? The blazing old man asked, and Delta was yanked a dozen meters, miles. I want a party, I want a ball. Two children argued over and over and didn't even notice her. She was flung hard into a new direction and threw up. Orange manner splattered like flying tunnel and Delta finally began to scream in panic. I want off, she yelled. She had flew past a dozen of the tiny forming paths, some barely looking like mouse holes. Nothing intelligent could be found there and Delta knew she saw a wall of fire and a face formed, smooth and beautiful, a face dead. She wasn't kidding about you. How the hell do you exist with only three? There was a face that was gone, and Delta was flung off to the far reaches of the world, and felt so homesick she wanted to cry. But never did she see the planet curve, or see the vast horizon dip. The tunnel she rode was straight, curving, only up much, down or sideways, for some time until something happened. She reached the end. The edge. Delta felt the tunnel come to a sudden stop, and she almost fell into the vast abyss below. There was no stars down, only above. What the frig? That was when she saw something odd. Well, just as odd as the world having an edge. One of the stars above crashed into the ends of the world, and in coming light chipped as it reduced to a mere teardrop, and it hit a mountain and acted like a fence to the edge. Delta felt her chest compress. A sense of knowing hit her as she watched the gem buried itself deep into the earth. She could feel someone behind her. It's not perfect, but it's what I managed to create. The young girl's voice said as she mumbled something. See? The girl sounded pleased, but Delta couldn't bear to turn and look. Her experiences with omnipotent children had never been good. A ghostly scene appeared over the landscape, and the empty abyss beyond the mountains was filled in as a fog of war had been removed. The land stretched and formed as a hole where the tear had fallen and began to give off a whitish manner. The world expanded and the darkness was covered a little more. 
Soon, monsters and people, like little puppets, began to explore this new land. The world is fragile. Cores are like nails. They help us hold it together. Sis explained, and Delta fell backwards and grasped as she was back in her core room. The world is flat, she protested this. Sis's voice was speaking with a little blunt, breaking the part fast as Delta returned to reality. Well, he didn't land curled up. He landed flat on his face, and I had to work with that. Don't blame me. Sis's voice vanished back into the system, her voice coming from the pure white box that crumbled away. And you watched her with a little interest. I hate to ruin a good reason for you to have a breakdown and all, but we're in the middle of a fight. It's good to see that your level 3 increases your mental durability, so that you are able to even hear Sis to some extent. How was the core connection tunnel? Sis has been working on that thing since before we were born. Only higher level dungeons can access it. So she promises. Anyway. Nu was cut off as Delta grabbed him and glared. Those were other dungeons. We have a chat function? Do you mean that I was too weak with only two floors? She shook and the box rapidly. Nu flicked out of existence and adjusted himself with those hands. So rude. Sis isn't just your system. Do you think that there is enough complicated things like her so every dungeon has their own copy? The sheer power of what would blow us and a few of the stars up, and don't be greedy. It's nice to share with your brothers and sisters. New was teasing, but the words hit Delta like a ton of bricks. Siblings. Dungeons. Her people now. To be fair, you are her favorite. I can tell and I shall help you rub this in her faces of the others with efficiency. New offered to help Delta rub it in the faces. Can I go back to screaming at mushrooms and setting things on fire? She mumbled. The answer came as her monsters finished shutting the doors and her manners seeped into the room. Delta blinked as the room corridor became a part of a dungeon. That was easy and worrying. Why would they just be let her take the room? She was about to ask when the room began to tremble. Not like things may be closer than they appear, shaking, but more like every inch of the room was shaking as her manner began to churn. Oh yes, I forgot to say, Sis says the room is configured, it might be a bit off. Delta slowly turned her head to look at him, like you've never forgotten things. Oh sorry, I was rather mean of me. Dalton pursed her lips and the unintended jab as was about to ask what had changed when the room abruptly exploded. Dalton coughed as did the most of her monsters as orange smoke filled out of the room. Sis said that the new rooms may uh, develop in odd ways before you even have a chance to do anything to them. Should be helpful for deciding what to make them into. I think. I hope. The statue of the silence and the intended to eat the world was replaced by something completely new. The flat world glowed with a bright new orange orb, and the moors of the monsters below were gone, as the four corners of the world were now supported by... Mushrooms. Good for soup, Jeb declared. Delta stared at the whole world, became more detailed. There were even some very tiny orbs of new colors on the map. Delta appeared at the odd map and Durance had even been filled in, but there seemed to be ants in the damn thing. She tried to sweep them off, but only managed to do something akin to zooming in. There were little multicolored orbs moving above. She poked one, the one with the more orangish tinge to it. Grimoire picked this, threw it at uh, rank E. Warning rank is merely Sis's guess as assessing threat level. Town of Durance is marked as S++ as a rule. Grim. Grim the kid with the attitude and so many issues that Delta wanted to choke him. That grin. Then she did another one. Dio, Poppy, Amster, Rudy was a little to the side and even near the core symbol. Good old Rudy. But many of the adults had visited didn't appear clearly. Was it because they were stronger or because the kids were more likely to take her manner in? Delta had to assume that it was now how she was tracking them. Ruli's orb looked half red, and the other half looked, well, less like an orb and more like a scaled tail. Odd, but that was Ruli. I like it, but now I'm worried that people are going to abuse this. Anyone who visits, like Kimmy, Delta tapped the girl's orb in the middle of Durance with a frown. She can be tracked by any jerk who tricks me long enough to get in here. She announced. The rest of the room looked a little nicer. 
four pillars now guarded and the statue of the Aztec-themed carvings covered the surface. Goblins drinking, a long one and with Bob looking rather scary, Fran, with his lance of light, Delta smiled at them all. Look, it's you! New pointed to something and Delta rushed over with excitement. Then her face went blank as the tiny arm looked to show a figure trapped under the mushrooms and goblins. If it wasn't so accurate, I'd be pinching you right now, she said bluntly. She opened the menu. Map room, a world but a mushroom throw away. Have access to the maps being locked behind a pillar puzzle, 20 dp. Core can deny intruders access to the map as long as the room guardian is alive. No room guardian selected. Create a random thematic room guardian, 30 dp. A prime mana cost to use the map. The more mana given, the more detailed the search, 15 dp. Allow people to pay a fixed mana price to hide themselves that can only be broken by a higher mana payment, 25 dp. Allow contract monsters to fill out details of the map by sharing with the map. 10 dp. She purchased the puzzle one instantly. Her pressing the issue was securing the map. The room guardian could wait just a bit. She didn't want to give up on the potential room guardian elsewhere by selecting this one now. The four pillars rotated in the wall of orange light, flashed as a hum resonated from the four pillars. Swar sniffed at it and he poked it with much thought. He passed through just fine, but Delta was still gasping. No, I got false fields, she exclaimed with joy. New seemed to say something and then corrected himself. Well done, you're a brilliant dungeon. Delta stared at the box and turned away, almost guilty. You're still upset by the memory jab you threw. She asked lightly, New didn't say anything. It's a sore point and even for me, it was crude. Delta smiled. She eyed the four pillars and saw many more images that had been added. The pillars now had two turning sections from each turning side, having an image of a monster. There were quite a few that Delta did not own. Some Hydra, a Minotaur, a little pixie. Delta eyed the creature and then eyed New. I bet if I had a dungeon pixie instead of a grumpy menu, I would still be on the first floor. A slip of the uh, keyboard isn't going to change the fact that you're my friend. Delta smiled as she watched as Billy easily solved the puzzle by sliding the correct 16 monsters that could be found in Delta's dungeon in a line. The light flickered off. Billy nudged one side and the light flickered back on. Billy stared and then Delta watched as he flicked the barrier on and off. On and off. It was like a kid and the fridge at night. A dungeon pixie is basically, look at me, I got some eye candy in the form of a tutorial. And I'm vastly superior in every manner. You want to make it up to me? I need a defensive strategy for this room. We got three doors and that means three ways of being attacked. Four if you count the way we came in. She said seriously, you perked up and began to scheme. But he focused on the little orb near the golden dungeon core in the large city. Delta blinked before smiling as the name of that appeared. Noland, she said. It felt like last year since she saw the man, but it couldn't have been more than a week or so at most. She wondered how the taxman turned inspector was. Delta bet that he was having a good time going home. Noland dreaded this. Returning to his file as his tax returns, sacks of gold and his pursuits, and the report on Durance's dungeon. Delta. Oddly, he felt that he was back in the dungeon for a second, a pulse of warmth down his spine. He shrugged it off and went inside the Royal Banking Association. He was going to get promoted and he knew that the title was Durant's Dungeon Record Keeper. Not the worst name, but it didn't mean that he was off his comfy routine of touring for taxes and now a dedicated man to the dungeon. The bank didn't like rotating taxmen and bankers between dungeons, as it made them into mere generalized officials rather than competent experts on that particular dungeon. Some dungeons only let you see some mere of their secrets if you absorbed enough of their manner or visited enough times. Old Reg, the bank manager, had been inside the royal dungeon more than any adventurer, and the guy had a room dedicated to him. Yes, it depicted Reg as the most boring human alive, but at least the dungeon honored him in some way. Nolan paused and then hastily bowed to the Princess Surma, exited the bank with two royal knights and a ragtag bunch of people. Mass, we shall begin tomorrow. 
Are you sure you can buy you more equipment or get you training? The princess asked the rather young boy. The boy beamed. Nah, I got my new sword that you gave me, and I'm ready to chop monsters' heads off. And I got you. You're awesome at blasting things. Mess, the boy praised. The princess retained her cool face, but Nona could see the smile playing on her eyes. One of the royal knights, Lady Brother of the Spear, who seldom spoke with the brevity when she did, but today she seemed to be on fire. You do not address the princess without deep respect and gratitude. Do not just anyone gets gifts from the princess. She reminded the lad with the spear on her back rode slightly. Zane the Blood Knight yawned, and the sheer aura of these people should have shaken Noland. It didn't make him look away, but honestly, after being stuck with Damagos and Quiss in a dungeon, he almost felt a little... let down by meeting the famed royal knights again. He remembered not being able to breathe around them before. You like Soma a lot. You're almost like sisters. Mass winked as the mouse mage behind them shook his head. Brother well, paused, and for the first time Nolan ever heard of, the woman looked lost for words. Close, Mass. Lady Brother has protected me since I was young, Princess Surma explained as they walked past. Zane slowed and sniffed the air. He turned to Nolan in the distance and tilted his head. You, taxman, where did you come from? Zane walked over and the people rushed out of the part of his way. Nolan tried to look calm and even meek. The man before him could and might even kill him citing some stupid defense law of the knights, but he honestly didn't care. He had seen an opera singing Demon Mushroom and the scariest jungle that he had ever heard of, and that was not including the tree woman. He stared blankly into the man's eyes. Do you have clearance for that information? Nolan asked with one eyebrow raised. Zane leaned down with a smile that hid his annoyance. I am a royal knight. Doesn't that cut me some snack? He pressed. Nolan thought about it, about letting Zane know about Quiss, Dabagost, and the Dio of that odd child. And Dalta. Nope, no it doesn't. Good day, Royal Knight. Please return to scaring people and killing things while I do my best to make sure the kingdom doesn't collapse under the weight of bureaucracy and gold. He walked past and Zane's huge hand softly touched his shoulder. I'll be filling out forms and paperwork to get permission. You got this real freckum look for a weedy guy and I want to know what place did that to you. Might have some good fighting there. Zane grinned, and his madness showed just for a moment before he reined it in. Later, Tax. Zane wandered off after waiting for the prince's group. Nolan finally breathed. He had been toughened up, and that direct touch had made Nolan feel like an egg before a dragon. He could be boiled, fried, smashed, eaten whole, or heated until he broke. Royal Knights, the most worrying thing was that Zane was hardly the worst. Dalton watched as the doors were repaired and toughened to withstand any more mobs of skeleton bears. Not that she had to worry with her having the bigger monster in the form of Jeb. Now Jack was naming the door slowly. That one there needs to the forge. Nothing useful there besides weapons, some explosive powder, and about a dozen or so metals. Next is the library, and to the other side. Lots of good reads like a hundred ways to cook your foes. Bloody history of the kings, and Huff, the magical dragon pop up book, he listed. Any monsters? Divina asked quietly. Jack rubbed his red scaled chin. Got some? So, you love Christmas, and Hydra's eight heads, one stomach, he offered. Divina's glare could melt steel. Not really. I think they got bored reading the same things over and over. With everything sort of resetting or reverting, they can't even write their own stuff. It's why they learn to talk to themselves or build pets. Boredom, I think, Jack explained, for those wanting silence and to end it all. They're not really great at enjoying doing nothing. So I sneered, Rail was calmly watching the north door, peering out as it led into the fortress. If an army was going to come, it would come from there. Delta wanted to go that way, lost if she could help it. She liked to make sure that her rooms didn't hide anything before she left her back and her monsters open for a flank attack from some ambush. Library first, knowledge and power, and all of that, she told Davina. Jeb, you stay here and guard the room. Delta told him. Jeb gave her a thumbs up, trying three times to get the right finger. I'll sit against the door, ma. 
Not gonna open with my butt in the way, he promised. Delta liked a troll. He was a smasher, a charmer, and now a doorstop. Keep the doors open on the way to the library. Jeb is strong, but I want a clear path in case you need to come help. Delta said quietly. Her group traveled slowly down the hallways. Delta gave Jeb one last look, and the troll kicking his legs and humming like a greet grinder. Just a little more than they could get to the forge and make it into a cave for Jeb. She had a feeling that it would be work better than the library. Their connecting hallway was more of the same. Stone floors and fake windows. Curtains looked limp and almost ghostly, and the lone painting depicted any grand city sinking into the hole. Cheery. The door to the library was actually a little bit smaller than the rest, and when Rail pushed it open with the end of his trident, it creaked and began to open slowly. Rail hit it again, and it crashed into the wall inside. No time for creepy doors. Books must be defeated. He declared the silence, the normal kind, was all that there was. Tall shelves of bound books, scrolls, picture books, and even some DIY titles stood out. Jack wasn't kidding when he said that it was empty. The small was of a quaint place of books. The odd revision power of the fortress managing to actually keep the mold out of quite well. Good thing that it wasn't all dark and creepy. There was about ten rows of bookcases, and the far end of the room had a smallish desk where a librarian could watch like a hawk, but it stood empty. Smaller paintings filled the walls, and a few banners were nearby. It was all standard fields, forests, meadows, dogs playing poker, and D&D-style battles against a dragon. Very plain things. The banners were of a deep purple, and showed a tiny crest of the moon crackling in half. Library conquered will take time to absorb to avoid overlocking Core's mental faculties. Delta watched as her manner flowed down, and the hall and the lone painting exploded into more orange smoke before the manor slowed to crawl just inside the library. That's twice today my mental faculties have been brought into question. New appeared. Do you wish to know about the pig breeding and detailed descriptions of pictures? Delta paused. Does it have pictures of cute piglets at the end? She tried. No. Then take your time going through it all, Delta scampered to see the new painting in the hall. The sinking city was gone, now showing the sun shining down on a dungeon entrance. The trees torn down now, replaced with the giant mushrooms, and the light making a home look magical, not dangerous. Much better, Delta grinned. Jeb was fast asleep in three minutes that they had been gone. His snot bubble was so large and Delta felt like she shouldn't find another monster cute, but really, Jeb was cute in his own way when he wasn't chewing bones and such. The slowly regrowing arm was a bit creepy, though. They repeated the same slow search of the hall leading to the forge room. This hallway was bare, without even a houseplant to spruce things up. The people who lived here didn't like much of the forge room, and as Delta watched her monsters approach, the smell of eggs, rotten eggs, and burning coal. Looking behind her, she didn't see Jib, so she guessed at his natural smell of the forge. What on earth, flat it was, could make such a stink. Rail kicked up door open, and something long and coiled inside the furnace lashed out. A snake skeleton tried to sink its fangs into her frog's shoulder, but he slammed the trident in between its jaws. There's a snake in the forge, Case said, as if the others hadn't been watching. Oh, that bugger. He's been growing for some time, like a real snake, but don't know how he's escaping from the revert field, Jack said as he rushed into the room to stare at the whipping spiked tail of the creature. Each spike seemed to be less than a thorn and more like a bone that had been sharpened. Those are human ribs. I assume it convinced a few of the grunts around it to join and make it bigger. Though, I doubt it ask. Soar said and bashed his staff into the creature's skull, causing it to recoil and rear up. Delta imagined that it was a cobra and had a skin. This would be where the hood would flare. Numb used rail as a springboard and axe kicked the ha- somehow hissing skull. There was a crack, and then Numb grabbed the snake's spine and bent it over his knee. The snake crumbled, and more of the black smoke flew through the air, then under the door Jeb was guarding. Danger over, Delta sighed. Good thing Rail's awareness is so good, she mumbled. Divina gave her a dismayed look. He didn't see it. 
He just reacted because Bob likes to tackle him and it's now instinct to reach like that to long body creatures. He's an idiot. She shook her head. Having no words to counter that, Delta watched as the room quickly consumed by her growing manner. The forge with its long abandoned hammer that looked fit for the hands of a giant. The stacks of metal walls and the barrels of half-finished weapons. There was a large stand for some missing sword. But Dalta ignored that as Swa began to audibly weep. My loot, he cried, and the black, gainy powder that was up next to Dalta waved a few fingers about. Better to do this fast before Swa saw. Forge room conquered. There was a heavy thunk. Oh wow, this item is magical and I can seem to absorb it. Dalta said loudly and peered down at the large shield with the golden spider on it. Thank you, Forge. Thank the golden bars. Dalta would be sure to put them to good use. Swa was on the shield like a child on a new toy. Mine, mine! I mean, well, the boys. But for now, mine! Swa hissed and he tried to heft the shield. There was a long pause as the room fully converted and the odd feeling as the manner shaking began again. Swa silently looked at Rail. Worry not, little firebug, I shall keep you safe. Rail picked it up with Swa still attached. Delta smiled as the room began to shift into its new form. This bug room configuration could be a pain. Release me, frog, or I'll stir and fry you, before feeding you to the closest thing to French people here. Swa warned, Delta's knowledge rearing its head in her monsters again. A flash died down and the forge room looked greenish. Moss, vines, and even grass had run wild in the forge room, reclaiming it for nature. Glowing flowers and dripping stalactites made Delta think of the buried ruin in a cave. It was really nice, and Delta could see it working well as a favor. She just needed to adjust a few things. She removed half of the forge to make the semi-small room for Jeb, added a small basin of natural running water to one side, and focused hard to think what else screamed troll, besides a pile of bones and such. Finally, she decided on something cheap and easy. Near the top of the room, she built a cheap bridge that went nowhere. Trolls and bridges, it was a classic. She tried opening the menu, and sure enough, the option she wanted was there, mixed in with ways to restart the forge, or even make a mine. Other rooms could do that, but Jeb's survivability was too important. Delta liked him too much for him to die now, and the hardcore knew would see it as a strategic advantage and keep her biggest monster around for free. Win win, troll troll. Turn room into troll cave, 25 dp. Delta hummed as she hit it. The room changed once more as the remnants of the forge was turned into a proper cave. Besides that, the hole Delta had made of the furnace was dug even deeper into a pit of darkness and wet earth. The room felt a little wilder than before and Delta eagerly opened up the new menu. Troll cave layer. Troll monsters can respawn here after a period of time. A troll takes up three of the five available monster spaces on the floor. Delta blinked and then another time. I can only have one troll. It takes up three slots. She said in dismay. She had resisted the gotcha guardian and turning down the forge into a mine. And while Jeb was safe, all she got told was that it was a fat even in terms of the system. She read on. Layer Upgrades Layer can be upgraded to hold two trolls at the expense of the other creatures, 20 dp. Trolls take 20% less damage from fire spells when inside the layer, 15 dp. Regeneration is increased when resting inside the layer, 20 dp. Create a proper home inside the cave, install two large fur covered beds and one very large cooking pot, 10 dp. Have troll soup available as a loot drop, 1 dp. Oh, that was fine then. Delta could get almost buy one, get one free deal in terms of monster slots. She silently apologized to Jeb for calling him fat when he was just big boned and perhaps big rocked as well, as she bought all of the options. The library would be done soon, so really, it only left one direction to go. Jeb looked eager to follow the scent of home, and Delta let him. The yells of excitement were made Delta's day. The following smells of cooking and the odor produce less so. She could now see why troll soup was so cheap. She hoped 
to God that there was a recipe book in the damn library because Stelter was not putting up with the concoction of jibs. It was like a moonshine of soups. Rude in gasoline mixed with a dead possum, she covered her nose and looked towards the lost door. Still, the direction gave her the willies, and she was not so sure that she really wanted to go on. But the thing was that she had attacked Sis new. She wasn't going to let that slide. Delta team, roll out, she ordered. She got a look of confusion and some of amusement. I find that some books lie unrolling at the right time, and it doesn't make you immune to damage. Better to run if you can, Jack offered. Just go, Delta said with a sigh. The last bowl was undented, helping along by a great return of magic. He watched as the gate began to finally open after forty years. Progress, ever since that damn scale rat had vanished. But he had sensed her. His master demanded core shards, and he would supply. He turned on his steed, his dark lance glowing with the power of silence. He reared back as his skeletal horse glowed with the same power. The gates opened loudly, and the sounds came to an end. The captain of the ending light pointed his spear, and the slaves and grunts that he had pulled back to fix the gate joined the mass to rush through the hall of the last feast and towards the depiction of the future. The end had come, and it rode on a dead steed. He charged, eyes ablaze, with the power of silence. Ruri stood before the entrance of the second floor boss room, covered in darts and bob slime. She wasn't winded, but she was nervous. She had no idea why it was annoying her so. Open up, I don't have time for this puzzle bullcrap. I need to help Delta, she yelled. The door didn't answer, but Rudy was sure that she was being heard. Listen to me, you childish dick of a monster. I heard from Quiz that you're a tree girl. Well, listen to me. I like your mum, and I want to help her. If you get in my way, I'll make you regret it. Don't you take what's happening down there seriously. She yelled, her body bulking up with power and nails turning into clawed weapons. The door opened. More than I cared to, wild woman. Take the stairs, and if I see you without Mother Delta on the way up, I'll make you regret it. Go now, your face annoys me. The woman, an actual tree woman, hissed. The mist parted and showed a clear path to the door that opened. The feeling that wrong grew even worse. I'll bring her back safe. Rudy said and pushed on. Thank you. She heard and she turned, but the mist had hidden the boss form from sight. Delta, can't you just adopt more friends? This one has issues. She mumbled as she took the stairs down two at a time. Cold. He was cold. He felt. They all felt the danger. But being her first, Fran came to a halt. He turned to the feeling and he knew someone. Something deadly was coming for Mum. No. Not while he drew breath. He pointed his lance to the door and screamed in rage at the mere idea of someone treading over Mother's core. He would crush their bones and feed them to bacon. Fran hit the door of the boss room and the odd feeling of wrongness, of not belonging beyond the store, hit him like a truck. But without Dancer, he didn't belong anywhere. So he urged Bacon on. Bran's eyes blazed as orange as his loss. He was her guardian. He would not fail her again. Never again. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 86. Oh, holy night. North from the statue turned map room was what looked like a feast hall. It truly was a grand sized place. Not anywhere near the size of a jungle, but Delta could see how the cult and the on one sort fence friends could easily fit in here. The style was simply but good of quality. The tables had various metal dishes and cutlery laid upon the surface. The black glossy wood had been sanded down to the level that ice would be jealous of. Delta eyed the forks. If they came alive with demon power, she was going to call them cultlery. That or French. All that was missing was a clock, a candlestick and a British teapot. The floor had some effort put into it and the simple flagstones replaced with a more solid stone surface. 
This was the first true room of this floor to not have any of the cave surroundings to be seen. Swinging chandeliers of black wrought iron creaked above as the candles remained unlit. The light came from a brightly lit corridor behind them as Dalton's manner converted the dreary gothic hallway into a brightly lit hall with rugs and squishy armchairs for the tired. The stitched mushrooms and everything was something Delta ignored, only by sheer willpower. The far side of the grand hall was covered in a wall of shadows. Delta felt more than saw her manner hit some weird wall before the entrance of the feast hall. Something was repelling her manner with rather efficient ease. The feeling grew more intense as the light flickered on at once. Dark dull flames of every candle and blackened torch. Delta was sure that that wasn't normal. The feast hall only had two other doors, a tiny door near the one corner that looked sealed, if Delta had to guess, and the other was a large gate that crisscrossed with iron bands and wooden bars about the size of an actual tree. The gate, tch, had been distracted and the wastes of calcium have hack-jobbed it back together. Jack growled in a low in his throat. Delta wanted to assure him that he had been gone maybe, maybe an hour. If Jack had managed to keep this gate destroyed for 40 years every day, Jack was off more talented than she had guessed. That or the court was just weirdly inept indifferent to security. The room was lit up by what felt like even darker shadows now moved and danced at every corner of her sight. Dalta wasn't worried about the shadows, however. She stared at the lone figure that surrounded by ten skeletons in front of the massive gate. Giant chains at either side of the gate began to creak as the screech as he pulled the bottom of the gate up a few inches, and then the massive gate slowly rose like an executioner's axe. The air that should have no reason to be trapped on the outside of the gate flowed into the space under the gate that made Delta's spine turn cold. Welcome, Lady Core of the dungeon, who has connected to our little home. The man on the skeletal horse spoke and urged his beast around to show its twin glowing specks of black and silver. The glow of oddly darker than it was bright, inverted light, if Dalton had to put it into words. Negative instead of color. Those twin black stars met her, and this thing, this man, could see her. Not even the third floor would cause sudden physical form, not this quickly. This person could see her. Unlike normal people, you don't talk to her. You don't even look at her, you maggot of this rotten earth. Divina stepped forward, a snarl under her words. The man tilted his head, yet a finely crafted helmet covered his skull and didn't even slide. It looked like the custom made for his bare skull, not a human head. The simple black tabard of the flowing chain mail and ended with the dark leather gloves of chain boots that didn't scream, Dangerous, nor did the undead horse that he rode. It looked a little sad, but she felt a little wary as this creep and that was annoying her. So, you're the tutorial boss, or did you get bumped down from a gimmick boss to a guarded front door? She called and this made the horseman pause. I beg your pardon, came the smooth response. Delta floated forward slightly and raised her chin up a fraction. Beg harder. Were you waiting in the dark for a little show? That's just sad, she added. Nonsense, if she just threw enough nonsense at this thing, she could give herself some time to think of a plan. The gate rose higher, and from the pitch dark beyond, countless dark eyes lit up. There was a literal army of dead, slimy, rotting, and other things crawling towards the gate in anticipation. Not good, very not good. Her small party, even with Jeb making up most of the bulk, wouldn't be able to handle that number. Their options were to fall back or to rush forward and destroy the gate. Delta decided that she would rather not have an army chasing her. Jack had done it a countless time, so he would be the lynchman to do. Her planning was cut off as the air rippled, and the man's hands were flung forward, and a long, dark spear was screaming through the air, right at her form. Delta's mouth made a little O. Oh. The horseman had just attacked. Well, Delta felt rather stupid for trying to be clever. Rail was the closest to her, and even then, his powerful form wasn't going to reach her in time. That spear wasn't going to pass through her. It glowed with an inverted light, malicious and hungry. 
Delta raised her hand and almost as if to slow down the incoming projectile, like she was some sunglass wearing trench coat chosen one. Her menu shut down, her awareness felt limited, now that her dungeon space twitched as something exploded past the map room, down the hallway and through the feast halls like a rocket on drugs. You freaking touch her and I'll chew your souls apart into so many pieces that even my dad would be impressed. Rudy hissed. Steam radiated off of her body, so much so that it swirled like an angry animal. Her usually dark skin was black and her hair curling and swaying. That was when the limited physics of the dungeon caught up and a howl of air and wind followed Rudy's path. Exploding into the feast hall, causing the tables and chandeliers to be ripped back and smashed into the walls. Delta's monsters managed to hold each other down, but a few skeletons were utterly crushed by the tables. Rudy stood and Delta choked back a cry. Sticking right through one of her hands was a spear. It had gone clean through and Rudy gave her a smoke, looking unbothered as she gripped it. What? Never had a splinter before. Looking good, Delta. You're almost visible. Rudy commented and yanked the spear free as she dropped it. It vanished and reappeared back in the horseman's grip. Huntress, you look young. No, not her. A daughter, perhaps. The man mused and Rudy's eyes blazed with the words. Did you just say, I look like my mum? Rudy asked, voice flat. That seemed to upset her far more than a spear through the hand. Speaking of which, her hand was already healing. Delta was a little wary about not being able to use a menu, but she'd take Rudy over a dozen traps and doors. Did I stutter? Yes, you look like that festering sow of a witch. I hoped the broken heart and broken soul we left her with would kill her, but it seems like she lived on. How is Mother Dearest? My master would be thrilled to finish the task. The horseman sneered and twirled his lance as the gate behind him was almost open, enough to let through the crouching monsters. But I guess that is a captain that will have to do. Welp of that foul wench, I am Captain Levix, and I will be glad to welcome you to the family. The man sounded far too smug, and Delta glared at him. Ruly is going to kick your ass. Delta said confidently. Jack itched his nose. She's strong, but that guy isn't a pushover either. He's got some mojo that meant I could never explode him. Speaking of, the gates are rather almost open, and then we're going to have a lot of problems to deal with real soon. Jack pointed out calmly. The gate creaked ever open, and her monsters all tensed at the sight of... Delta felt her mouth go dry. There were so many of them that some were crawling along the ceiling and walls in order to get to the hall faster. Levix held up both his hands. What's the matter, Lady Core? You think a dungeon would approve of the simplest of strategies? Numbers win. Numbers that never go down win even faster. Huntress's whelp. Come, let me offer one of the three bloods, tainted as it is, to my god. Let this prison be shattered. Levick screamed, and Delta truly saw the horseman was insane. Completely and utterly bonkers. Rudy's hair whipped wildly as a maelstrom then leaked off her skin. The form of a crown of black, curly hair came to ebony black curved horns. Rudy shrugged off her jacket and her fiery red veins pulsing all over her black skin. If I wanted to listen to this kind of crap, I'd go watch Dio's puppet show for the toddlers that he puts on every weekend. Every word that you yammer is just boring. I've got three things that I want in life, Captain. Rudy's voice was smooth and utterly human. This seemed to confuse the loon more than Delta had managed to. I want a drink, I want a fish, and I want a hunt. I don't see any fish, and I left my drink upstairs. So that leaves me with my last vice. Rudy rolled her neck and her aura turned deeper red. Third floor manner does wonders for my half-breathed stuff. Compliments to Delta, one for having a bar in a dungeon. She gets a favor from me. Rudy's eyes met Delta's, seeing her. You're a cute for a core. Not that I had any doubts. Leave the worst to me. You got a hero incoming to deal with the bonehead. So I'll be doing the boring job and end the army. Rudy grinned, fangs sticking out. Delta's mind was silent for a few moments. Of course she's cute. She's our mama. Mum pointed out. 
No doubt, Ruli nodded. I get my best looks from my ma. Jeb said from the back. Ruli eyed him and whistled. I've missed this so much. Ah, well. Next round is on me. Stories are the best told over drinks. And maybe after we clear this floor, we can get some spare ribs to go with them. She began to calmly stroll forward. Enough! Levick screamed and charged forward. Ruli didn't break stride. She even began to whistle. The dark spear was pointed at Rudy's head as the bone horse moved in an alarming speed. That was when Delta felt it, finally letting what her dungeon senses had picked up go through to her. A shadow crashed into the room, leaping over Delta and her monsters before a mighty clang reverberated through the hall. The lance of dark light struggled against the blazing orange spear. Who are you? Levick said, glowing, lights bugging out of his skull, and an unblinking stare stared back. A real honorable knight, didn't your god know that a jackass is to be ridden, not promoted to a captain? Do you have the guts to face me? Fran growled, as Bacon butted heads with the dead horse. Piggy outrage showing all over Bacon's face. Dalsa was so damn pleased to see him that she didn't even care that he had sworn. And... Was that a pun? He's all yours, boss man. I'll be back once I make some of these cosmic horrors cry for the mummies. Rudy stepped through the gate, and with a crack of the both hands, she lashed out with the gate screaming as it collapsed into the rubble and metal. Trapped with the army with Rudy. Poor monsters. Even Delta felt a little bad for them. They had nobody to love them. A filthy goblin and a pig. Is this some kind of joke? Levix demanded as he gained some space between himself and Fran. Delta was ready to spit her monsters out when Fran gave her a look. It conveyed so much in so little time. This was his moment. Do I look amused? Fran answered as Bacon stomped the ground in challenge. Guys, get to that sealed door. I don't want Fran being ambushed by something. She ordered. Rail frowned before he looked at Fran and then understood. We're all a little pig-headed. He grinned, and Avina nearly strangled him. Show him the power of the gobs, Swa demanded. Swa had always, always respected Fran to such a level that he had never even sassed the boss in his own mind. Delta was sure of it. Num and Buddy shared the same grins. Levix eyed them, sneering as he gathered odd dark manner into his free hand. Delta's first monster... Her very first monster and boss faced down the bone captain. He pointed his spear at the captain and burst into an aura of orange flames. You shouldn't dismiss the gob on the hog. Fran said simply before Bacon blurred forward. Bravery, Lance. Lance's voice boomed as the explosion of orange light cut cleanly through the orb of inverted light. A skill. Monsters cannot learn skills. Levix hissed, his own spear stopped by the orange light from touching the bare bone. Fran, standing form, grinned dangerously. I do a lot of things that I shouldn't. Guess the world hates you so much that even I can bend the rules if it means destroying you. Fran shouted, and Bacon sped away from the far side of the room. Fran lowered his spear with clear intent. You challenge me. I am the Lord's weapon in this domain. You dare to come into my hall? Levix would have spat if he had any fluids left in his body. His own lance lowered, and the two went still for a moment. Fran's small smile grew. What are you saying is that you are a mini-boss of this floor? Then that's all I need to hear. Fran lowered his head, ready to charge. Finally, getting the differences between our skills. Levick sneered, he saw stomping the stone, causing sparks to fly. Yeah, you're not even the main event. You're the lackey of a lackey. Fran said simply. Levick took the insult with all the grace of an eager maniac. I am Captain Levix, the lord of the ending light. You are nothing. Levick growled. Fran risked a glance at Delta. His smile went a little soft when she gave him the thumbs up. My hero, she remembered Rudy's words, wrong. I am Sir Fran the Pig Knight, the firstborn 
first promoted, and first guardian. I am the lance of Mother Delta's kindness, and her shield against cretins like you. I am the first floor boss, which means that in dungeon terms, I outrank you. You flee, but Meiji curl. Ran charged, and Levick screamed, charging as well. Rail finally kicked the door open, and Delta's monsters rushed inside, leaving Jib to guard the door. Delta watched as the orange and non-light clashed. The room around them shook hard. Fran, being outside his boss room, caused issues. This hall wasn't dungeon space proper. If he fell here, Delta shook her head and cheered. She cheered her damn heart out. Fran believed in himself, so Delta could only do the same. Ruli ripped a glow zombie in two, using its glowing spine as a whip while a flying, drooling bat creature down the middle. Teeth, fangs, claws, suckers, soul tongues, tentacles, everything was flung at Ruli. It was like a first bar crawl in the abyss, but slightly fewer imps died. Those that didn't burn from her leaking demon power were shown what happens when Ruli doesn't get to drink. Things died. She pushed through another large room. Some fountain spurted black ooze, and that sent her senses into the wary mode. The fountain raised her hackles more than the monsters that are dead. It was some type of garden space with the uh, nine doors? Jeez. Delta was going to have a lot of fun with all of the space. Something crashed down from above, and Ruri looked unimpressed, as a giant lion with a snake for a tongue roared at her. On its side was the same symbol. All of the monsters, even Captain Bonehead with his fancy tabard, had that symbol. Like the trident, but the left prong of the right prong curled, like ch- leaving only the middle prong erect. It was like the cold symbol, and seeing it made Rudy's teeth ache for some reason. She felt demonic, nature, abyssal, angelic, spiritual. This place had collected creatures from all planes and branded them with that symbol. Rooney glared at the hound of the same god of justice snapped at her. They weren't stupid. They were putting back the nature and abyss creatures to send holy things at her. It was clever, not a little pointless. She was only half-demon. She kicked the angelic harpy hard enough that it rained down feathers. Still, the numbers were numbers, and she couldn't fight forever. She was sure that she killed that one fish dog thing three times now. Girly, catch! A strong voice yelled from the wall of eyes and teeth. Something parted, and a wave of foes. Ruli caught the sword without really seeing what it was. She saw a red form vanish through the door, and Ruli felt her demon blood sing as the sword in her hand came alive. It glowed with the powerful runes that made even Ruli feel impressed at the craftsmanship. She gave it a swing. Lots of things died. Ruli grimmed darkly. The army hesitated for a second, and then heads began to roll. Levix was a jerk to say the least, but the man was skilled. Delta couldn't ignore that as much as she wanted to. Fran was sent skidding back as his lance smacked off his shield. And natural strength giving the skeleton the advantage in the sheer physical matchup. It wasn't all one sided though. Fran being shorter meant Levix had to overreach, and sometimes Fran managed to use that to smash a few ribs. If Fran was fighting on Delta's space proper, he would be stronger, but there wasn't enough room to fight proper in the other rooms, and letting the silence cult reach the second floor was not even being considered by Delta. Fran and Levix passed each other, and Fran was sent off course as Bacon took a hit. His steed was mighty, but Bacon was also alive. It meant that the man could take jabs at Bacon, as well as Fran, while Fran's blows on the horse didn't seem to bother the creature. Your pig rider, you have some talent. I shall have to see about mounting your head on the wall somewhere. An honor, I assure you. Levick said, reattaching his jaw that Fran had almost knocked loose. I'll mount my lance in your skull, Fran replied coldly. Levick chuckled. You'll have to reach it first, you cocky goblin. He fired back and they charged once more. But something was different. The longer the captain fought, the more energy seemed to expand and climb. It was coming from the collapse gate, but Delta had no idea 
what was causing all the free energy to flow to Lavix. The steel door and her monsters had gone through led to a giant kitchen, and just as Delta guessed, another sealed door that led beyond the gate as well. A few of the smarter creatures had tried to use the door to sneak past the destroyed gate. Like ants in a hive, they just never seemed to end. Rail, wielding two pots, crashed the skulls left and right as Billy fried oil covered arrows for Swa to ignite over the ooze puddles and the floating bones in them. None of these things could be allowed to get past and help Levix. Jeb reached and crunched another web crawler skeleton, and the troll was doing great at catching the sneaky ones. Delta needed Levix down so that she could start trapping the hell out of this place. She spun as Levix's spear glowed even deeper, inverted, and his power growing as the stupid rates that Delta wanted to call hacks on. What the hell was going on? Levix raised his spear, and two coronas of black light surged out. Curving, it was broken in places and it looked weird, but Delta could see it was exactly the same as the symbol on the front. It was weirdly curved to Pong Trident. His manner, or whatever that dark energy was, looked exactly like that. It was freaking Delta out, just looking at it. Two did bend and flee, but the strong remains upright. The silence arrived, not with a bang, but with a point. Levix's glowing eyes seemed to gleam as Fran was pushed back further, and further with each dash. Fran! Delta moved forward, but her sharp gaze was kept as still. Trust in me, he panted. Bacon looked exhausted. One of his tusks had broken off in the fight. I do, but I can't lose you either, she said, her voice frail. Levix snorted. Ladies first. I can accommodate that. He almost seemed to purr. Delta glared hard at him. You're a filthy cheater, and I don't know how or why, but you aren't the only one who can cheat, she warned. Levix didn't seem that scared of her words, but the small break had given Fran time to catch his breath. You won't touch her while I live. Fran and Bacon stood at the ready. Levix's dark aura grew thicker. Then I shall end this quickly. Swine rider. Levix moved and he swung his large dark lance over and over. Fran's flickering lance kept up for a few seconds, but the growing gap in power balanced was quickly wearing Fran down. This wasn't... this wasn't fair. That was when bravery of Sir Fran could no longer withstand the cruelty of power. Delta moved before she thought, and before she could logically think about what she was doing. Delta wrapped her arms around Fran, tears dropping down as dark glances raced through both of them. She felt Fran and Bacon's warmth, for their being their souls. She felt them and wept for what was to come. Then she got pissed. Sis watched with a frown as the boss module FB flickered and then blinked out. The orb cracked a little and the boss creature met an end. Being outside of the safe net of her power, Sis closed her eyes. I'm sorry, she whispered. She reached over to maybe preserve some memory or a seal to forming a hole to prevent corruption from the seeping in the silence when all her screens went black. Sis had never experienced a shutdown before and just stared for a long moment. Then one by one her screens turned back on. Her calm white and blue screens crackled with orange sparks and one screen merely just overloaded. I think I might have to start isolating Delta from the overall matrix, but this is kind of fun, Sis admitted. She looked below her, way below her, where another small form was curled around, a glowing orb similar to the one of her own chair. Brother, did you pick up the odd one this time? She sighed. The boy grumbled, tossing in his sleep. The full moon was gone. They could only talk when the eye of the left stared down and the eye of the right stared up. She laid back and watched as her delta connected to both eyes and turned them orange. Physical shell in her brother, soul in the sister. Dungeons truly did have access to the most important bits. Shame they never did anything with them, until delta. She just hoped that no one freaked out when the moon changed color for a brief moment. Levick stared. He just couldn't understand. His lance looked sad as the energy had been cut in half. 
He stared, the creature of equal height. The round pig looking pitiful before had now grown to a monstrous size, the taut muscles and black eyes. The rider upon the back raised one hand and a wickedly barbed lance glowed with power. Then he raised the second lance in the air between the two tips crackling loudly. What did that woman do? Levick's hissed. There was a thunderous roar and the entire right side of the hall was torn up and awash with orange energy. The silence that followed made Levix nervous. He felt... scared. No, that couldn't be it. The sleeping avatar of the call was resting in her arms around the knight's body. The goblin looked more like some ogre than a pest of a goblin. My mother did what she does best. My mother did what she does best. It is a quirk that I admire, but I wish not to inherit. It seems to be hazardous to logic and common rules, the deep voice of the warrior said. He showed no reaction to having doubled in size and leaking far more power than he had any right to own. But if you wish to know, I guess that I was given the most powerful tool available to a boss, the goblin said, and the boar inched forward with a deep snorts and hot air. What power can, could, beat me? Levick sagged lower on his steed. The goblin grinned. A second form. There was an ear-shrieking blast and Levix fell. Fell, and there was only silence. If Delta was awake, she would have seen a simple box. Sir Fran's second boss stage is now unlocked due to... Error unknown. Captain Fran of the Defender can be fought in very rare circumstances. Cool down three days. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link to below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.